You are God's workmanship. Ephesians 2.10 says this, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. The word workmanship is such a great word. It's the Greek word poema. And a poema, like a English poem, is a work of art. It, it literally means a one-of-a-kind original masterpiece created by a master artist. Think about how God looks at you. Have you ever thought of yourself being a masterpiece? Have you ever thought of yourself being a one-of-a-kind original? Well, that's how God looks at you. One of our pastors here just had a baby yesterday, a little beautiful baby boy, and I, I promise you, mom and dad, as they look into the beautiful skin and face of that newborn child, see nothing but perfection because their love influences their view. And God loves us so much, it influences his perception of us. And through Christ, in Christ, he sees us through Christ as his masterpiece, a one-of-a-kind original work of art. There is a great verse in Jeremiah 31, and God's speaking to people that were really hurting. And he says, you know what, I've not only not forgotten you, here's what I really think about you. He said this in verse 3 of Jeremiah 31. The Lord appeared to me of old, saying to me, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you to me. Again, I will build you, and you will be rebuilt and restored. God is talking to people that feel somehow abandoned and hurt by the difficulties, sometimes intense difficulties of life. And God says, I've always loved you. I love the thought of you. Jeremiah begins by God saying to him, before you were formed in your mother's womb, I saw you, fell in love with you, ordained a life for you, gave you a purpose. And the same is true for you, my dear friend. God has loved you with an everlasting love. He'll never stop loving you. He's always loved you. He loved the idea of you from eternity past, and he loves you now. And there's nothing you can do to make him stop loving you. That's how much and how powerful and how perfect and how unconditional his love for you is. There's a couple more verses in this chapter. Verse 12 says, Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion, streaming into the goodness of the Lord. What a great sentence. Streaming into the goodness of the Lord. Israel was being restored. This is the prophecy of it. And that natural fulfillment has a spiritual application for God's people as we, through Christ, stream into the goodness of the Lord. No matter what happened in your life before Christ, you're in the river of God's goodness now. You're in the streams of heaven's loving kindness and care now. That's how God cares about you right in this moment, streaming together in the goodness of the Lord. And it says this, their souls, the souls of God's people, shall be like a well-watered garden. A their soul shall be flourishing. Every inch of the soul, every inch of the soil, flourishing with, the, with the, the planted seeds of God's purpose, His promises, and their potential, all flourishing like a well-watered watered garden, and they will sorrow no more at all. And God says, I know how to stop sorrow. I know how to vanquish it. I know how to heal you from trauma and pain and sorrow and I can water your soul until the dryness of loneliness and brokenness of dysfunction, pain, anxiety, and depression, it, it all leaves by the continual rain of my loving kindness upon you. And he says this, I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and make them rejoice rather than sorrow. Verse 16 says, I will satisfy, satiate the soul of the priest with abundance and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, says the Lord. Man, oh man, think about that. God says, I'm going to manifest so much of my grace, my goodness, my glory, that my people will say, Father, we're satisfied. Like David said, your loving kindness is better than life. There's nothing else to contrast, to compare. Everything else diminishes in value and significance compared to your love. I've loved you with an everlasting love. God calls you his masterpiece. He's always loved you. 1 John 3, 1 says this, Behold what manner, what quality, what fashion of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God, the children of God. Man, you are loved. Love brought you into the family of God. Love hung Christ on a cross for you. Love keeps you as a part of God's beautiful fellowship and, and, and family 
love speaks to you through his word and by his spirit, God never stops loving you. And everything he does to you has love attached to it. There's a meaningful consequence of love in every action of God to his church. Even when we need some discipline because we're, we're out of order, he does it because he loves us. He loves us and wants us to get on the right path. That's what God has for us as believers, this revelation, this quality of love. 1 John 4 says this, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. 1 John 4 verse 7 says, um, uh, God's love for us, that he has given us, he's, he's gifted us the gift of love. But, beloved, let us love one another, why? because love is from God and everyone that loves knows God. He that does not love doesn't know God yet for God is love. That's the truth. God is love, he loves you. And he wants to make your heart a well watered garden. He wants you to know that you're a one of a kind priceless masterpiece that he sees so much value, so much beauty in, so much honor towards you. Yes, God's obsessed with you. God can't stop thinking about you. You're that important to him. And he wants you to know how loved you are. Make sure in this season that you let God's love dominate your thoughts. Fill your heart with hope. Hope makes not ashamed because love is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Romans 5, 5 says. Make sure you're winning the love battle. God can't love you more, but you can grow in your revelation and your understanding and your experience of that unbelievable love. You are so loved, my dear friend. God bless you.